Good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening. It's a pleasure to, to share with you some thoughts about long acting therapies and what might happen when things go wrong. I'm Dr. Kalkani from the University of Turin, and I will just go through some introductory slides and then present you a, a clinical case we, we actually followed this summer. So um, I, what I think import, is important is just to take a look at what happened in terms of virological failures to patients switching to long acting chemotherapy and real PIBRI. Uh, I think the data suggests that these events are rare, between 1.3 and 2%. And if you take a look, these are the, the, the longest follow-up. So this is the trial, the ATLAS 2M trial, and this is the, the 152 weeks uh, follow-up. So three years of follow-up. Uh, you see here in the bars that virological non-response was low, between 1% and 2.7%, with some difference between once every month and once every two months injections. And, and globally, so we have 14 confirmed biological failures. And interestingly, uh, two failures were observed between the second and the third year. So very late, actually, failures. And th that could be important for us for understanding what happened on the long term of this treatment that we actually don't have that, such a large follow-up for, for a large number of patients. So if you take a look at them, uh, there were uh, there are two male with a low BMI different countries, they were taking a drug every two months, different subtypes, with only patient two, having the infamous A601 uh, subtype. And importantly, uh, there were selection resistant associated mutation, both for rupivirin and from carbotegravir. This, I think, is an important point. Uh, and uh, I took this slide from, from the summary of characteristics that relates to what happened until week 96. If you take a look here, uh, seven patients uh, every, in the every two month administration, uh, select resistant to Lpivir and five to, uh, to Cabotegravir and one and two uh, uh, respectively uh, in, in patients receiving the drug every month. So the selection of resistant centimetration is rare. You see here numbers are pretty low uh, as compared to a thousand, almost a thousand patients receiving these combinations, but still that may impact our, our uh, choices and our treatment regimens afterwards. Yet, uh, uh, the data we have now in 13 out of 14 patients, uh, they were able to resuppress on oral basic regimens. One that was actually judged not to be that adherent, it was not able to. So the majority of those were reaching viral suppression uh, with oral treatments. The interesting thing is that if we tease out adherence, because of course patients are taking injections, and of course uh, we all include in this kind of analysis on those taking them uh, in time with some uh, uh, a few days window. Uh, if you if you see here, this is the union multivariate analysis uh, that performed on the Atlas and Lattice studies, and you see here in the gray bar uh, in the light gray. You see the factors. So there is something about PK. There is something about body mass index. There is something about sit times. Uh, there is something about uh, resistant associated mutation to repivirin and all female gender and every two months administration. But then in the multivariate analysis, only three factors were retained as independently associated with biological failure, and they were the HIV subtype by six A one a BMI of 30, and repivirin resistant associated mutation. But if you take a look also at how much each of these factors is associated with failure, you see the effect is very small. Probably when you, when you start to have at least two factors, you see it raises to 25%. That is not actually very small. And then we only had one patient with all three factors, and that patient failed. So this 100% is just a bit unfair. But I think it's important to know this and to see what happened in, um, in, in real life. So that, that goes to our clinical case. Uh, um, so he's a male, 44 years old. He was diagnosed three years ago uh, for, for a three months history of abdominal pain, low appetite, weight loss, actually lost five kilos, neutropenia, um, and larger liver, and we thought of steatosis so because of the ultrasound and increasing ALTAC that she has. Uh, after three years. Uh, he actually started with very low. So he's a very low presenter with nine CD4 cell count and a CD4 to CD8 ratio 0 0.1. Uh, HIVRNA was about uh, around 1 million uh, copies per ml. And he also has the replication of CMB um, in blood. You see here 26,000 copies of CMB. And no other confection, no other comorbidities. So it was actually, uh, uh, didn't have clear opportunistic infection at this time. 
Also taking a look at his baseline resistance test, you see it was a B subtype and there were not major or minor resistance associated mutations, such polymorphism, but all of them are not judged to be uh, so far uh, clinically relevant in terms of uh, reducing the efficacy of the drug we're gonna use in this patient. So what we did, well, actually we did, we used a Vulcan cycle there. Uh, I know it could be also be an interesting discussion of what to do in patients that just have CMB viremia without having great ideas of colitis. We, in those with a very low CD4 account, we usually have a short treatment with Vulcan cycle there in order to reduce as much as possible CMB replication. Uh, it's not a prophylaxis uh, with cotrimoxazole, some colocalciferol for vitamin D deficiency, lansiprazole for G-reflux, semiprazolam for anxiety, and then it was taking care in terms of psychiatric and psychological consultation and get rid of this um, uh, benzodiazepine. And then it was started on taf ftc bictegravir with a short response. So it took some months to get to uh, viral suppression, and so HIVRNA was below 20 copies of one year. Uh, after a very good decrease at the beginning, it stayed between 100 and 300 for a long time. And this is something we observe very often in late presenters. So we don't know that actually worried about it. Uh, also, CD4 is low increase. And finally, at one year, it was about 200 uh, CD4 account. count. Um, so three months afterwards, so 40 months after treatment didn't start, uh, it was still a lansoprazole on demand. It wasn't our recommendation, but it still took it sometimes. I was taking TAF FTC big tegavir with a viral load below 20 copies and 244 uh, CD4 account. Um, so he was enrolled in one of the trials, and, and without leading, he started long-acting carbotegamory epivory. What happened here? So this in, in this light blue are CD4 cell count. You see they were pretty stable between 2 and 300, so with some oscillation, but still between 2 and 300. Uh, while HIV RNA remained below 20 copies until month seven, where we saw the first raise in HIV RNA, so 116 copies, then confirmed to be 53, but then went back to suppression to below 20 copies. So patients was stayed actually in treatment. But month 13, uh, HIV RNA raised again, 194 copies, and at the control, that was actually two weeks afterwards, was 5,000 copies, and so on. Uh, for this reason, patient was withdrawn from a trial and changed to another treatment. Luckily, we, uh, in this patient, we had three genotypes, and all three genotypes uh, suggested there was no resistant associated mutation, both in re for repivirin uh, or and for uh, carbotegavir. So it was switched back to TAF FTC bictegavir, and one month later, HIV DNA was below 20 copies and CD4 were, were stable to 191. So I think one important point could be pharmacokinetics, um, and we're gonna discuss about it afterwards. Uh, you see here the numbers. I also have to admit that we are not very good because at the times where uh, he had a programmer visit of the trial, we didn't collect the samples for PK. That would be the best sample because it was would be a, a real trough, let's say. But still, we can have some information about how, how these numbers a uh, um, work on, 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 on a figure. So this is a slide I asked Katia Marzellini permission to, to, to show you. This is one from, from our of the um, group recently published papers. It's a real life TDM uh, registry of patients receiving long acting capotegal repivirin. And you see that repivirin concentration plotted at the almost right time point are either on the median values or above them on the contrary, if you take a look here at these blue asterisks, uh, these are carbotegavir concentration in our patients. They are uh, actually below what is expected in patients this, let's say, at three stage because we're already around one year. They, and uh, if you take a look at these, for example, uh, sample at 37 days, it's approximately at the 10th percentile. So kind of low, uh, lower than the majority of patients receiving long acting carbotegavir period. So, now it's just my interpretation. So uh, I think we can discuss this, why this happened. Um, well, there, I think it it's, might be multifactorial. So there might be different, several reasons, maybe in all of them together. One is probably this patient was a very late presenter. So he's probably his reservoirs in terms of lymph nodes, the gut, the brain were really full of HIV in terms of HIV RNA and DNA. And, and so, there might be some release of HIV RNA from these reservoirs. And that's why what will serve in late presenters with these viremia that persist in for longer times. 
Uh, some interesting data suggests that most of these viruses, the defective virus, just being released, and we're not able to tease this out that, uh, unless we use very advanced technique. Um, I think I also have two questions for you or for further discussion. So what about dual therapies and sanctuary sites? So we know that if we don't start with dual therapies in advanced patients because the failure rates are higher. Uh, so maybe it was an early switch. So maybe not the perfect choice we made in this patient. Um, but it also raises the, the, the question, what happened in sanctuary sites when patients are switched to two drugs? So we don't have much data so far. We have a couple of papers suggesting in terms of CSF, HIV, RNA, CSF inflammation, CSF neuro and markers of neuronal damage. There's not difference between dual therapies and triple therapies, but I still think we need, we need to have, get more data and all, on other compartments as well. The second point on this topic, I think is the interaction of, of herpes viruses. So mostly it's CMV and EBV, because we've been knowing their effect in terms of inflammation, and boosting HIV uh, for a long time. Um, and this patient had a high viral load of CMV uh, DNA in, on, on blood, uh, no EBV, but we know that this, these viruses can actually enhance HIV uh, replication. That might be part of the story. We don't have CMV DNA controls over time, so I, I can't tell if, if CMV was still replicated one year after treatment, and now it's in common. And the last point is about uh, pharmacokinetics and mostly about chemotegory pharmacokinetics. So what do we know about this topic? Well, in the same paper I showed before about union multivariate analysis factor associated with biological failures, uh, the researchers suggested there was an effect uh, in Atlas and Flare studies in which low carbotegravir and repivirin concentration at week eight were actually associated with failure. And also suggested that at least the majority, majority say 70% of patients that have biological failures had plasma concentration of both drugs below the median value. So they concluded, say, that we don't have enough data to, to, to let's say, uh, to tease this out, but that could be a contributing factor. And also they observe the association between high BMI and low uh, carbotegravir repivirin exposure. That's my, what led to our uh, practice now using longer needles and maybe taking uh, a special attention to obese patients starting those treatments. Um, again, just going back to the, to the real-life TDM registering switch of HIV cord from Katia Marzolini's group, uh, they also reported that 13% of patients had low repivoting concentration, lower than expected, but also there was a single patient with very low carbotegravir, very low repivoting exposure, uh, and this guy had, well, was injecting anabolic steroids before starting uh, um, carbotegravir longatin, but also had enhanced physical activity raising the question if that enhanced physical activity may result in greater absorption and therefore a quicker elimination of um, carbotegravir repivirin. So I think this is also an interesting question I need to, to assess in the future. I also want to, I found it interesting that NRS suggested to perform TDM, therapeutic drug monitoring patient, receiving long-acting carbotegravir repivirin. Uh, in certain occasion, uh, certain indication, you see here the third point is virological failure including low-level viremia. I think is our case in this, in, uh, uh, of this patient. And you see the other thresholds were actually low for a pivot below 32 nanogram per ml, but uh, below 1,120 nanogram per ml for carbotegravir. And in our patient, we had at least two out of three determined measurements of that not try that were below this, this threshold. So maybe a risk factor. So the very last point is what should we do? So what happened if we see a patient on long getting carbotegravir pivot and we see a raise in HIV RNA? So we need to confirm this, uh, but maybe waiting for the confirmation and bear in mind all the studies suggesting that the selection of this associated mutation were, were kind of rare, but important in terms of the impact on future therapies. I think maybe we can think of introducing uh, a, an oral compounds to, to compensate somehow because we don't want the virus to replicate with a, with a very low tail uh, of drugs uh, uh, in, in their blood because it's a perfect scenario for selecting resistant associated mutations. So I just put here two hypotheses of oral uh, drugs uh, that we, the high genetic barrier that may possibly introduce a while waiting for confirmation of this, of this viral load. And with this, I think I just wanted to, to enhance the discussion of, of this topic of the reason why patients may fail, something about PK, is something about what should we do while we wait for confirmation of HIV or May. Uh, with this, I just would like to acknowledge the, the work of all people working in Torino on, on, on HIV and, and, and TDM. 
and I want to thank you for your attention.